Hello, I'm Rupert Sheldrake. I'm here with Mark Vernon. Hello, Mark. Hi there, Rupert. Hi. Um, we've been doing a series of dialogues for a very long time now, several years, and uh, we meet and talk about things that we're both interested in. And um, we share these uh, th online. And what we're talking about at the moment, the last two dialogues have been on Dante's Inferno. And today we're going to talk about uh, Dante's, uh, this is the Divine Comedy by Dante, um, the, uh, his section on purgatory. Um, Mark has written um, a wonderful book the, 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 within the book. There it is. <laughs> the divine, the Dante's Divine Comedy. Well, in this, the, the, the Divine Comedy by Dante, Dante is led through hell, purgatory, and then into paradise through by Virgil, or at least through hell and purgatory by Virgil. And we're led by Vernon, um, uh, as, uh, who leads us and explains Virgil's lead to Dante. So we have an extra guide. Dante's guide being Virgil and, and Mark, uh, you're our guide for, the, for, for at least certainly my guide. Um, and I must say, I think your book is quite wonderful because like most people, I've heard about Dante's great book and, uh, it, and it's one of the great classics of Western literature, one of the great products of medieval European literature. Um, and, uh, Yet, when I've tried to read it, I found it virtually unreadable. I just didn't know what was going on. And even when I read the Penguin Classics translation, which is very good, the one you recommend, I still find it very hard to know what's happening and, and to get the big picture. <coughs> Excuse me. And your book um, gives a wonderful guide to canto by canto, section by section uh, of this so one can actually feel what a tremendous imaginative journey this is. It's an imaginative journey about all the different aspects of human life and all the ways in which people can go astray and get trapped um, and all the ways in which they can be liberated as well. And since you're a psychotherapist, um, uh, I love the way you make this relevant to where we are today and how, how it applies to us, not just to people in the Middle Ages. Yeah, well, I probably said before that I got into the writing the book um, at the end of a long process, really, of engaging with it myself, having begun very much with, I know this is a spiritual classic, and as with all spiritual classics, it therefore transcends any one particular religion or culture. Um, but how do I find a way into this? Um, and it was partly my own psychotherapy, actually, and to... To, to nudge a bit towards the purgatory, um, purgatory is the canticle in which people are changing very dramatically. And so it, it was very important to me um, in my own therapy, my own journey, um, to see what was happening with Dante and begin to think, oh, well, maybe something a bit like that could happen to me too. Um, yeah, so the purgatory particularly is kind of close to my heart. Yes, well, I think what, what's so interesting is the way that you show in the Inferno parts, which we discussed in our previous two dialogues, um, what these are are not some kind of vengeful God punishing people who, in, out of a kind of sadism. Uh, they're pictures of people who are trapped, completely trapped, shut in into their own worlds and obsessions. And and that, of course, is something that happens in the modern world. I mean, it happens at all times. There are people who get trapped and shut in and completely closed off from any power of anyone outside themselves or anything outside themselves to lift them out of that and completely enclosed. And so all the different ways in which people can be trapped, you uh, described there. And what's so interesting about the purgatory is the different ways in which the they're partially trapped and trying to get out of it. And the first thing actually that I thought I wanted to comment on is the topology of it, which uh, we finished our last dialogue with the descent into hell, which is going down into the earth to the very center of the earth. And when Dante and Virgil get there, instead of coming back, they carry on 
and come out the other side of the earth. It's such an ingenious idea. So purgatory is in the southern hemisphere, a, man, a mountain in the southern hemisphere. And at various points, Dante comments on the fact the moon's in a different position and the stars, you can see the southern stars. Um, and that's very fascinating that uh, you come out the other side and are ascending by keeping going, ascending up these different levels of purgatory. Um, and I was interested in the part before they actually get onto the mountain of purgatory and ascend to the different levels, they're in an, a kind of area where there are people who are not quite even in purgatory. For example, people who've died sudden deaths and who rely on the prayers of people on earth to help them. And that was a, a whole interesting category I found. Yeah, it's not it's, just sudden deaths, is it? It's Yeah, so sudden deaths or, or late conversions would be the kind of traditional way of putting it, but people that suddenly in the last moment realise there's more to life than they'd assumed, um, and just, just before they die, as it were, are ready to see more. And so as they die, are able to enter a place where there's more. Um, but yeah. when they arrive there, as you say, in the kind of um, foothills of Mount Purgatory, they're not at all sure what's going on. And so the first people that Dante meets there are people like that kind of wandering around a bit aimlessly and not quite sure where to turn next. Yes. I mean, it's a bit like, what sometimes people say of ghosts, that ghosts are individuals who died for one reason or another. They were too in love with material life or there was some kind of trauma um, that wrenched them when they weren't ready and um, so can get stuck in particular places. And there is an echo of that, I think, in these early parts of the purgatory. Yes. Well, that, that's, it was all very, very interesting. And they... The inter another interesting point is that when one gets into purgatory proper on Mount Purgatory, where there are these different levels, um, people are able to pray for themselves rather than rely on the prayers of others. Um, and they're actually involved in their own transformation. That was, that was a fascinating point. And, and it's clear that applies at each level of purgatory. Yeah, it, there's, there's this kind of part of the early sense you get that things are changing is where people's prayers, um, I think you can say, become more aligned with the divine will. Um, so at first, the first people he meets, they're rather grand and they ask Dante to ask their still living rather grand or rather holy relatives to pray for them as if somehow God's going to be persuaded by a slightly glamorous um, intercessor. And, um, you know, it's a t sort of tendency that you can recognize, um, you know, when you when you want prayers, when you're feeling desperate, um, the idea that a holy person is praying for you um, is has its own persuasion. Um, but gradually what happens is that um, the figures that Dante meets ask Dante for his prayers and then they, um, as you say, offer to pray for Dante too. And so you get a sort of middle ground where people are starting to help each other. And, and that, of course, is to become closer to the divine life, um, which is generous and so has a kind of surplus that is freely um, distributed and offered around. And, and so in their very praying, they're becoming closer to the divine. Um, and that's how their prayers answered. And then, um, uh, you know, eventually, um, people just hold the whole situation in mind and are open to what's around them. And that openness to what's around you, rather than feeling I need, I must have, um, which, you know, is an understandable reaction when you're feeling desperate. Um, but that is one of the early, the early lessons. I think that's right in Mount Purgatory. I'm getting, in a way, when you get your prayer right, your prayer is answered. Um, that's kind of one of the ways of putting it. Yes, I'd, and I was also interested by the actual topology of Mount, there's different, seven different levels uh, as you go up Mount Purgatory. The lowest level, the furthest from the summit, is people who are there because of pride. And it's interesting, it follows the standard medieval uh, listing of the seven deadly sins. And the ones at the bottom, um, pride, 
envy and anger. Um, in, in a sense, though, those are the spiritual sins of pride and envy. They're the worst sins, according to the normal taxonomy. And it's interesting that they're therefore the furthest away from the summit of Mount Purgatory. Um, and then um, after anger, um, it's sloth, isn't it? And then uh, sloth, which is not just being physically lazy, but by being spiritually lazy. Um, and then after that, it's avarice, um, wanting money and, 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 and so forth. And then gluttony, which is wanting, you know, food and drink. And I suppose drug dependence is a form of gluttony as well. It's a, as you put it, it's so inter every one of these you put so interestingly that wanting things that can't satisfy. So those who are there for gluttony are a bit like the Tibetan image of the hungry ghosts. Uh, which have those thin necks that, however much they eat, they can't ever get enough to satisfy them. Um, and then finally, uh, the, the top is lust. And in a way, lust is the least bad of the seven deadly sins, um, because it's the closest to love. And whereas pride is the worst, because it's the one that most encloses one in oneself. And uh, it's all about me, if one's proud, and, and my own glory, etc. Um, I found that, that really interesting, the way that the, the seven deadly sins are sort of brought to life, in, as it were, in, 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 in a way I had not seen them brought to life before, um, yeah. in a very vivid way. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, there's, a, there's a very astute psychology that can often get lost when the sins are presented just as a kind of checklist. And if you veer towards one, then you're in, in serious peril. Um, they're much more presented than they were originally, actually, which was as the, the idea of the seven deadly sins came out of the desert mothers and fathers in the third and fourth Christian centuries, where people turned inwards and found these qualities within them, and but realised that actually they weren't just to be purged in the traditional sense of kind of got rid of, but actually they were the way to go. They were tracking the path, which of course is what happens for Dante up Mount Purgatory too, that they don't try and get rid of the pride, they go into the pride. Um, and, and this is where, in another way, it gets more complicated than a kind of Deadly Sins 101, is that Dante explicitly eventually um, talks about them in relation to extremes. You know, so pride is complicated because on the one hand, it's a mix of vainglory um, which does lock you into yourself. You, in a way, vaingloriousness is to regard yourself as God. Um, and it can be deadly because even if you realise you're doing that, it's almost like you haven't got the organ to allow the true divine in, in extremists. And so, you know, in psychotherapy, you meet people who they, they loathe their pride and yet they don't know how to get rid of it. Um, but on the other hand, you need a kind of dignity, um, you might say, to stand up and so to carry the journey towards God. And so this is a more Aristotelian way of putting it, um, that, um, that the virtues are in between the extremes of vices. Um, and I think that's another way that interests Dante because he wants to see something like pride, not as something that condemns you, but that as something that, let, that if you address it, enables you to develop and change and transform. Um, and that's that's a key idea, I think, in purgatory. It's not about purging in terms of stripping off. Um, it's actually in a way about, well, to use the Blakeian phrase, it's kind of cleansing the doors of perception um, so that you can see more and more and resonate with more and more. Um, but through these qualities that we have that can so easily go wrong. Yes. Well, the same would apply then to anger. Where the, on the on the terrace of where they're at the level with anger, there's these dark clouds everywhere. Where people are in the darkness caused by anger and rage, they're just it blackens out, it blacks everything out. Um, but again, the point that comes through there is that anger in itself is a normal reaction. What's wrong is excessive anger, anger or protracted anger. Yeah, no, I mean, it's really a really crucial point because anger appears in paradise, um, but then it's the anger that can sort of clear the clouds rather than bring down the clouds 
um, to see things more um, truly. Um, you know, there's a kind of energy in all these sins, actually, um, that you don't want to lose the energy because the energy is that which propels you. And of course, it's most obvious in the subtle twists and turns between lust and love, as you mentioned. Um, but yeah, and I think that's partly the reason why, you know, there's a kind of um, sense of the, the length of time that people spend on Mount Purgatory. Um, they often discuss, you know, Dante sometimes surprised to see someone so soon after their death, quite high up the mountain. Um, and then at other times he's surprised to see someone sort of languishing on a lower terrace. Um, and, um, you know, the, the psychological insight there is that um, there's, there can be huge nuance that really can only be kind of lived through to really work through it. Um, and so whilst the times I don't think are supposed to be taken in literal terms, they're, they're, um, they're kind of qualities of time, much of them strict quantities. Um, but nonetheless, at that level, they make a lot of psychological sense. Um, sometimes, you know, with these things, you just have to put the time in. But of course, on Mount Purgatory, they've got hope. They can see the sunlight and they can look up. And they're encouraged all the way because the higher they go at Mount Purgatory, the easier it gets too, actually. And there's a deep spiritual truth in that, um, that um, when you realise that what you're suffering is giving way to what you can experience um but it's through the suffering that that happens um that you're able to embrace these things more and more and so in dante's mythology that it gets easier to climb up mount purgatory yes one thing i wasn't clear about actually was that everyone has to climb it but some people have a besetting sin which you know some people are much prouder than others and others are much more lustful and others are more envious etc what wasn't clear to me is whether say you're someone who's tremendously lustful but not very proud or tremendously envious but but uh, you know not very gluttonous for example um, would you you'd go through these different levels but you might pass through them quickly if that's not your particular problem and then you sort of slow down and get stuck in the ones which were a big problem. Is that how it works? Yeah, but and Dante, Dante says that, yeah. So he realises that he's probably going to have to spend quite a lot of time on the Pride Terrace um, because, you know, he's a successful, well-known poet and um, tang untangling what you might now call the sort of ego against um, the generosity of being a great poet and artistic and creative is, is, is a complicated business because you need sense of uh commitment and sense that you're worth something um to pursue that art but when he gets to the terrace of the angry um they travel through that quite quickly and he even says i think if i remember rightly he realizes that he won't have to spend much time here and if you remember in the inferno when they encountered those who were locked in their anger who really couldn't find a way out of it um dante can see that quite clearly he doesn't collapse it's not overwhelming for him so that you, you get something about Dante's personality. He's sort of, he's mastered his anger, you might say, in his mortal life. And um, whereas pride and lust are going to be more complicated. Yes, very, very interesting. And I, I thought the section on envy was particularly interesting because it's full of barren rocks. And, and you, the point you make is that envy drains vitality out of life. It creates a kind of desolation. It's sort of, the opposite of generosity in a sense it's sort of draining out energy rather than putting more in and um i thought that was a really good description and um is that his main point there that it's life draining envy yeah so you know the the, the souls they meet on that terrace have their eyes stitched shut um which again in first instance seems really brutal but um there's something deeply revealing about that is that they can no longer envy the world around them because they can't see it. Um, but a bit like maybe going cold turkey, um, sometimes you need to be locked in a room to get through um, the phase of addiction. And um, so they um, have their eyes stitched shut, which means that they can only reflect on their own lives, which at first is a kind of torture, but then can turn and they start to love their lives and they find um, what they desire 
within themselves and then become much more open to what's around them as well because um, they know that they share in that rather than um, long for what they feel they don't have themselves. Um, again, you know, envy is, well, sometimes in psychotherapy, you say that there's kind of a jealousy that can be good um, because it can inspire you to yearn for more um, and to work on yourself, but it can slip into envy. That It's just a kind of technical distinction that's made. The words are used interchangeably in, in real life, but the point is it can slip into a kind of envy where, first of all, you try and steal what someone else has, you know? So if you're an author, you might think, oh, well, I'll just pretend that idea was mine um, and slip it into what I'm writing rather than giving it a proper credit. Um, but it can become really destructive when you can't tolerate the fact that someone else has got what you have. And so you go out to destroy them and it becomes, that's what, that was more uh, an infernal state of envy. Um, people on purgatory kind of know that they're stealing. They know that they might have had murderous feelings towards those whom they envy. And so be able to, to begin to make that inward turn. Yes. I thought the stitched up eyes was an interesting point because in the traditional in Southern Italy today and Greece and Turkey and India, the evil eye is, is widely believed in. And the evil eye is primarily the eye of envy, looking on something with envy and you blight what you look upon. That's the general belief. And the evil eye goes with the look. And here the envious have their eyes sewn up um, so that would prevent them casting the evil eye, as well as turning their attention inward, so they couldn't any longer direct this to outer things. That's I didn't know that. That's fascinating, actually. It reminds me a bit of how sometimes sight is said to be the possessive um, sense um, that, in a way, um, you know, we treat we, we can. It, it's not always like this, of course. You can contemplate, and that's very different. But sight can be a bit grabby, a bit like using a camera. You know, you take the snapshot, and then you think you've kind of got it. Um, whereas if you have your eyes shut and you have to listen, you have to be more porous and open, and and let things in, and they kind of have to you know mingle within you. So sight is sometimes said to be um, the more spiritual sense than 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 sight. Sorry, uh, hearing. Is said to be the more spiritual sense than sight. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of resonances, but that's very nice about the evil eye. Yes, well, I think that, you know, it's still widespread, this belief. It was widespread all over Europe in the Middle Ages, here in England too. Um, and the, the, the belief and fear of, of, of the evil eye waned after the 17th century. It was part of the, you know, the sort of both Protestantism and enlightenment and science and so forth. It treated it as a mere superstition. Um, but still, lots of people still wear amulets against it. You know, in Greece, they were those little blue eyes and or a cross. And lots and lots of people in modern Britain wear a cross around their neck, you know, even if they're not practicing Christians. And these are really amulets against the evil eye, protective um, against it. And um, so I'm sure that must have been in Dante's mind when he was writing about that, because it was such a widespread and powerful belief. Yeah, I'm, I'm reaching in my mind whether it's <coughs> even directly referenced some point in the Divine Comedy. I can't immediately think so, but um, yeah. Um, interestingly, in the Paradise, he does go blind at one point, and it's like he has to shut his eyes to adjust to the light that's round and about. Um, so it, it it's... There's a kind of protective element, but there's also this transformative element with it as well. Um, yeah. But it's also what you were saying about vision is interesting, because if you think about what you can envy, you could, might envy somebody's house, you might envy artworks or sculpture or stuff they've got, or the beauty of somebody. These are all visual things that one can envy and want to possess. But sound isn't something you can possess. Hmm. I mean... You can buy works of art. Rich people like building up art collections because they can have a unique painting or sculpture or something, or, or buying expensive houses because then they know that wonderful architecture. Um, but you can't really buy music. Uh, you, well, you can. You can buy Bach's B minor Mass, for example, and have it streaming on, 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 online, or you can buy a CD of it, but you can't uniquely own 
Bach's B minor mass. And you can't uniquely own words. You can own, own printed words as copyright, but you know, with, with spoken words, the flow of words and the flow of music is much more unenviable in the sense you can't envy, you could might envy the people who can play it so well or sing it so well, but you can't own it in, in the same sense you can own a work of art. Um, yeah, no, you, you see what you mean? I mean, music has to be sort of given away to be enjoyed. Um, whereas, you know, a rich person could buy a work of art and even lock it up in a bank so no one sees it. Um, yes. Let alone even just them. Yeah. Yes. You couldn't lock Bark B, Bark's B minor mass up in a bank. That wouldn't make sense. No, it wouldn't. Unless there was a unique copy of the manuscript that no one else had. Um, but then you'd turn it into a static thing. Yeah. But music is a process and, and uh, not a thing. And, mm. um, and so is speech. I mean, written, uh, spoken speech is a process and not a thing. Um, anyway, I thought that was fascinating. Let me just look at my notes here. Um, uh -huh. um, Oh yes, well, when the um, perhaps we could say a little bit about in our last few minutes uh, about where they get to at the top, because they can uh, when they arrive at the top of Mount Purgatory, they enter something like Eden, a kind of paradise-like realm, a kind of perfect garden, and and uh, that was very interesting that they arrive in Eden, and or, or do they actually call it Eden? I've forgotten. Yeah, it's called the Earthly Eden. Yeah, um, right at the top of Mount Purgatory. You, you can imagine it as a, a sort of plateau. And it's after Dante has been um, crowned and mitred by Virgil, um, which I think means that Dante can now trust his desires. It's not to say they always go straightforwardly right, but they can never fundamentally lead him astray anymore. He understands himself well enough to be able to kind of guide himself in that way he needs another guide to take him into the cosmic realms um, but the, the 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 quality of the guiding changes Virgil's helped him navigate his inner life whereas Beatrice helps him navigate um outer life and um so the the Eden at the top of Mount Purgatory on this plateau is a kind of transitional space where it, it feels earthly, you know, it's, it's a beautiful forest and enchanted garden and the streams and beautiful light and so on. But it's also um, uncanny because they realize that um, the plants and the living things there are taking their life straight from the divine. Um, they're not undergoing processes of metabolism and so on in the way that we're familiar with. Um, and uh, yeah, and it, it has these kind of enchanted qualities. Um, so the wind that blows is actually more like a spirit and it blows towards, I think it, 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 it moves you towards the divine, towards the sun, towards the east. Um, so, you know, it kind of, it's where what we experience as a kind of bit of a mix of the earthly and the heavenly is becoming seen because um, this is all about what you can see um, as divine, I, you know, again, William, a link to William Blake perhaps makes a sense, you know, in the earthly Eden, you see the sun as the angelic host crying, holy, holy, holy. And you put to one side um, the other description, which Blake famously gives of seeing the sun as if it's a guinea glowing in the sky. Yes. Well, yes, I, I, it was, it's very fascinating, but they have quite a number of I was surprised that they had all these adventures in Eden. Beautiful woman walking the other side of a river, for example, this apparition of this beautiful figure who's not Beatrice, but some other beautiful woman. That was a big surprise for me that, that, that these adventures continued in Eden. Yeah, well, they, they go on right through paradise as well. Actually, it's one of the things I love about the Divine Comedy is that in a way, the closer you get to God, the more the adventures come, but also the more you're able to engage with them. Um, but yeah, so they meet this figure who eventually is called Matilda, and she's maybe even a unique creation of Dante, um, but she seems to stand for, um, you might say, um, for Dante at least, the kind of female enchantment personified. Um, and, you know, in the scholarship, they'll make links to how courtly love was the dominant kind of personal love 
in literature in the medieval period. And so courtly love is the love where you don't seek to consummate it in a physical sense, sexual sense. You seek to let it draw you towards the divine, to awaken the God within you. And so now Dante, he's passed through the fire of the lustful terrace. So he knows and understands Eros now how it works. And so that he shouldn't seek to um, possess a woman, but should seek to allow um, his love to draw him uh, more and more. And so Matilda is a bit of a, well, she leads him to the encounter with Beatrice. I mean, maybe you want to say something about how that struck you as well. Um, but she um, is this kind of intermediary figure and works with Beatrice in Dante's journey through the Eden part of the Purgatorio. Well, I wasn't, I wasn't, yes, well, the Beatrice thing was very surprising too, because there she's this vision of beauty that, and which the love that draws Dante on in this whole process. <coughs> but she suddenly turns, uh, turns on him and is extremely sharp tongued and has this sort of vicious attack on Dante. And that, again, was a complete surprise. It didn't seem consistent with her character as this vision of beauty that led him on. She was suddenly scolding him and with a really sharp tongue. Yeah, no, I mean, I wrestled with this for a long time because it is quite painful to read, actually, because it's not just like a quick slap down and then all lovey-dovey. Um, it goes on for two cantos. Um, out of the 33 of the Purgatorio. And, and even at one point, the angels say to Beatrice, because angels have appeared in a tremendous pageant, and angels say to Beatrice, look, cut, cut him some slack. He's been on a long journey here, and they sing a psalm of mercy. And Beatrice says, no, he's got to hear this. And the way I've understood it is that, um, and again, it's you, you do pick this up in spiritual traditions and wisdom traditions, is that when someone can trust their own desire, they've got enough discernment of it, they can still want to hold on to um, their beloveds that awoke that desire in them. Um, so for example, it made me think of, of Rumi, who famously was abandoned by Shams, his guide. Um, and this was quite a long way into their friendship when Rumi was obviously completely clear about the trip, um, the spiritual qualities of his poetry and the, the journey back to gold and so on. And yet Shams just suddenly disappears. And it's sometimes explained in the Sufi traditions as um, the final um, crisis where Rumi could turn fully to the divine and, and realizes um, that he didn't need Shams and that uh, he could let go of his final attachment to Shams in order to follow the divine. And, and in, the, in the Christian tradition, it makes me wonder whether it's a bit like that strange moment on the morning of the resurrection where Jesus appears to Mary in the garden and she thinks he's the gardener. She then sees that it's Jesus. But the first thing that Jesus says is, do not touch me. Um, again, you might think a hug would be in order, um, mm. but he says, do not touch me. There's a kind of um, cut. And then he says, I'm ascending to my father and your father. And so I think in that is this clue that Mary has to realize that although Jesus has awoken him, her to this possibility of knowing God, now is the moment for her to know God direct, not through the intermediary of Jesus. Um, and so it says, do not touch me. And I think there's something a bit similar that Beatrice says to Dante, look, I, what, your encounter with me awoke love within you, but you're an idiot. You thought it would be fulfilled by being with me. Didn't you see that I even died? You know, she says quite harsh things like my body rotted. This thing that you thought was beautiful was never going to hold the divine beauty. It's transient and would be the slightly Buddhist inflection on that. Um, and so in right in this moment of their reuniting, um, she, I think, um, forces him really to see that he must be now desiring the unity with the, with God, not just with her. And that's necessary because then she can guide him through heaven. Um, if she doesn't do that before they enter the paradise, um, then he'll constantly be sort of half hoping that eternity will be spent with her uh, rather with, than with God and her in God too. Well, yes, that's so interesting. Um, well, that of course leaves us on the threshold of paradise, which we'll have to come back to. Uh, 
I haven't read that yet. I've only uh, got to the end of Purgatorio. So before our next dialogue, Mark, I'll um, read your guide to Virgil. No, it's no longer Virgil. That guy. He's disappeared. It's now Beatrice that's the guide. So um, uh, I'll read that, and, and then hopefully we can discuss that in our next dialogue. Yeah, well, thank you. Thanks for... Um... Um, for you know, reading it all and going through it, and I, but I, I, I'm glad because it's really important. Because you know, as you said right at the beginning today, um, people kind of get the inferno nowadays, but a bit bemused by the Purgatorio, and, and even more so by the Paradiso. Um, and it feels to me that it's crucial for our now because we do live in a bit of a stuck, trapped cosmos that's closed in on itself with materialism, and um, so understanding the paradise. Um, and realizing that um, actually we live in a cosmos that is abundant, not scarce, that's um, that's full of light, um, and so on, is is really crucial for our times. So, um, thank you for pursuing um, the book, continuing with it, and I look forward to talking about that as well. Well, thank you for writing it, Mark. I mean, it's a wonderful. It must have taken you an awfully long time to think, read it, digest it, think it through, and and write that. And um, well, I would have been much too lazy to do that myself, and um, I just feel very grateful to you for having done this and made it easy and, and being my guide and many other people's guide uh, to this wonderful work of an imaginative journey, which is a transformative journey for all our lives. Yeah, well, look, thank you. Um, it changed my life, so I'm just delighted to be able to pass that on. <laughs>